Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to the next of our tutorials. Um, in this session, Christopher Oag um, from the University of London is going to give us an introduction to the TEI Text Encoding Initiative XML um, language. Go ahead, Christopher. Thanks. So in order to introduce TEI, it's also worth reminding you of some principles of what XML actually is as, as a language. So uh, this bears some relation to TEI because TEI happens to be expressed in XML, so it has to abide by these certain principles, some of which Gabby already mentioned, um, but also on a more abstract level, it's that XML is a meta language. So it's a language about markup languages. And this is why XML can take on many different kinds of vocabularies, including the TEI, but including others, as I'll mention later. But it's also a model, it's a data model. It's a formal model that represents text in an ordered hierarchy. And the reason why we do this is that we tend to think and write in hierarchical structures. So novels contain chapters, chapters contain paragraphs, and paragraphs contain words, and so on. We tend to think in this way anyway. Um, and XML is one practical attempt to formalize and represent such documents in a machine readable language. Machine readable, of course, if you don't know this, is the way in which a natural language can be communicated to the computer so that it can interpret what's in the document. And computers can operate more quickly and efficiently on ordered hierarchical documents or trees as they're rendered. Um, when they're operating on, on non-hierarchical or flat documents, it's much harder um, for the computer to, to um, process it. So large amounts of data can be managed and transformed efficiently if a document is modeled as a tree. And in a moment, I'll show you an example of that. Just a reminder too, that XML is what's called an OHCO, an ordered hierarchical content object. So the hierarchy imposed on documents does depend on the state of the surviving documents as well as one's own research questions about those documents. And it's important to emphasize that one document can be encoded in many different ways using multiple kinds of hierarchical structures. So one project may have multiple hierarchies that coexist in different documents. One document might have multiple hierarchies. Um, your layer of editorial attention on a document has its own hierarchy that might be completely different from someone else's layering of, of hierarchical information. So there is no one hierarchy for XML or for TEI. There are multiple, and it tends to depend on what you're attending to in the text. But what's the difference between XML and TEI? I already hinted at this. Um, the, X, the XML specification details the rules for the language. So um, elements, as we know, in XML are delineated with angle brackets. And the rules, um, are, are specified by certain standards like the TEI. So there are many other vocabularies of XML in every kind of domain of knowledge that you can imagine. Just in, in journal publishing, there's a, an XML uh, vocabulary called JATS, eBooks, uh, uses bits for book interchange. Um, all of these are written in XML but have different vocabularies. There's even a beer XML standard. So the TEI recommends a specific vocabulary and structure for naming elements and attributes and sometimes attribute values for humanities data. So for example, um, many humanists might be looking at encoding plays in TEI. So on the left-hand side, we have printed text of a play. <clears throat> And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I kind of understand as a reader uh, what the difference between a scene and uh, a scene description is and a speaker and, and stage directions are, but how can you make that explicit in your data model? Now, XML allows you to do that, but what TEI does is it constrains the vocabulary based on an agreed upon set of standards for naming these elements of drama. So as you can see, there's a head element that indicates clearly what the heading of the play is. 
There's a stage element for stage direction. There's a SP or speaker element that names who the speaker is, and that is broken down into the speaker label and the actual paragraph of text. These are all standards that have been agreed upon by the community in the text encoding initiative so that there's consistency in our data models. And here again, I've got the same example rendered in TEI, but also rendered on the right-hand side as a tree. And as you can see here, this is why, again, processing an ordered hierarchical content object is so effective, because each of these nodes contain other nodes, and that allows for a very swift and efficient processing of the data. So what is the TEI exactly? Um, it's an international consortium of institutes, projects, individual members um, within and outside of the academy. It's a longstanding consortium. It was established in 1987. It's still a very vigorous organization. It's also a community of users and volunteers that are creating hardware and software independent methods for encoding and archiving humanities data. And it's important to emphasize that the TEI was primarily established for archival purposes um, and for especially creating consistent vocabularies for making this uh, data interoperable and shareable. So there's really a, a, an archival um, ethos to the, to the fundamentals of the TEI. But it's also a very flexible set of guidelines that comes with recommendations and examples for over 570 markup distinctions, depending on what you're interested in. It's also a tool for producing customized schemas for validating your project's XML text. So the way that you can validate your text, as Gabby mentioned in the previous video, is by creating schemas and rules. You can write in XML documents a schema that constrains and names the appropriate uh, kinds of elements and attributes that you use in your project. And finally, and, and very importantly, uh, the TEI is a set of free and openly licensed style sheets for transformation into all kinds of formats. So HTML, Word documents, PDFs, databases, RDF for linked open data, slides, EPUB, all kinds of, of of transformations. And this is important because XML needs to be transformed in order to be readable for most people and for most purposes. So they offer free style sheets and some publication tools for rendering XML data in various formats. TEI is also very pragmatic. It's based on consensus. It's based on organizing and structuring textual resources, image, and other media. Um, based on community needs, based on what scholars and archivists and librarians need in their, in their work. And finally, uh, the ultimate ethos, I think, for the TEI is the archival format for long-term preservation of digital data. The idea here is that there is no um, one program or, or no one piece of hardware that you need to, to access TEI data. It's platform independent, it's interoperable and shareable, and that makes it a much more um, a long-term format for preservation. The TI community consists of many different parts. There's a consortium with, um, with members uh, who pay yearly dues to belong to the TEI. There's an executive committee. There's a technical council that works on technical issues ranging from actually writing the TEI guidelines to um, creating style sheets that I've, that I've mentioned. Um, but they also help to create software. There's a user community that offers feedback based on their own projects. And a lot of times those, um, those people who offer feedback create special interest groups for improving the TEI based on particular project needs. So for example, people who are working on medieval manuscripts created a manuscript description special interest group. Other people working on letters created a correspondence special interest group, and that led to more improved TEI guidelines. This is how most people access the TEI guidelines online at tei-c.org. This shows you the 23 modules of the TEI guidelines, um, which may seem a bit intimidating, but most people use this like 
like a reference manual, not like a novel. Um, and one particular way that you can try to navigate the TEI for your own purposes is this appendix that gives you element lists. And this is where you can navigate um, through alphabetical um, designation, different kinds of elements. And when you click on these elements, it gives you descriptions of the elements and also what modules these elements appear in. So this can help you explore the DEI guidelines and figure out what might be useful for your project. So what can you encode with the DEI? Essentially, the DEI takes a general and agnostic approach to any textual structure and verbal phenomena. So I mentioned before, that um, the same text might have multiple ways of encoding it, might take on multiple hierarchies depending on what you're attending to. So it doesn't say that you have to use a particular um, set of tags. It doesn't say that you have to do anything in particular. It's not called the DEI laws. It's called the DEI guidelines for a reason, that they're flexible and subject to change. So a textual approach to doing this is based on the codex, essentially. Um, it can work for non-codex material too, but the textual way of doing TEI is essentially, um, it is essentially making um, codex-based material into machine-readable uh, documents. Now, the, the verbal approach, mostly based on linguistics, um, or for interpretive work is a completely different way of encoding a text with TEI. So instead of say, encoding a book of poems, you might just encode rhyme schemes in poems, or you might encode uh, phrases and other linguistic features in poems. And these would take on very different hierarchies and tag sets. Um, in theory, TEI can cope with anything. Um, of any complexity, um, although in practice uh, that can that can become an issue. And uh, most people would tell you that um, a, a good TEI project tries to constrain itself uh, rather than try to do too much in the beginning. Um, so a whole range of, of, of different projects can accommodate TEI from books and journals to letters, manuscripts, postcards, rolls of papyrus, clay tablets web pages and all kinds of text and material um, that have very different vocabularies attached to them. What distinguishes the TEI um, from another XML document? Well, every TEI document has a standard template and they need to, they need to have two parts. Uh, every TEI document must have a TEI editor and the TEI header contains metadata. And the, the metadata required is fairly minimal, but the metadata is what's describing the document, who authored it, what the title is, and so on. Um, and the second part is the text element, which is enclosed within a text element. Um, and its structure is represented by elements, including a front element, body element, and back element. Front is for front matter, body is for the body of the text, back is for the back matter. Um, and within these structural divisions, you can have further uh, subdivisions encoded within div tags. <clears throat> the TEI header, the first part, must include a description of the electronic file inside of an element called file desk for file description. And within that file desk, you must include a title statement with a title and an author, and ideally others responsible for the electronic text. And then the publication statement, which provides publication details about the electronic text in some kind of structured way um, or rendered in prose within a simple P tag. Um, and finally, um, a description of the source. Uh, so this can include bibliographic details about the text material. Um, it can include a list of, of people. It can include a list of organizations and places. Um, it can include a manuscript description, um, anything that has to do with um, the source elements of the text. So this is um, how your TEI document might look, um, or at least this is how the template would look if you opened it. Um, here I've opened a, uh, a TEI template in the Oxygen XML editor. 
This is fairly standard. This shows you what um, the elements I just mentioned look like. This is the basic structure. And, um, and then you just get encoding. Now about encoding, I mentioned constraint already. Uh, the TEI offers 570 elements or more and more than 200 attributes. That's a lot. Just like you cannot read all the books in the library, um, you can't also read all of the TEI elements unless you're really, um, really into that, which is fine, but most people don't need to do that. Um, it's important to emphasize that TEI is not specifically a schema. Um, so editors can select TEI documents and attributes from TEI modules that apply to their projects. Um, but strictly speaking, if you select a document with a TEI all schema, you're technically allowed to use all the TEI elements that are available to you. But ultimately TEI is the basis um, for representing your text and using standardized vocabularies um, that can be the basis for further customization or subsetting of particular elements that might be necessary for your own project. So most projects, I would say, only require around 25 or so elements. Some use even less. I've seen projects of really big data sets only use one or two elements. Um, so Having a sense of what your project needs and being able to constrain your practice, um, hopefully with a schema, um, using TEI elements can make the project much more manageable. So what kinds of outputs might you make from TEI? The TEI enables you to encode uh, your interpretation of the materials using um, various kinds of, of, of data models. Um, what you end up producing from TEI is a complete step. As I said before, any XML document needs to be transformed in some way. But it's important to remember that, that there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between TEI and any particular output. So the TEI is a set of interpretations and a PDF is a view generated from that set of interpretations, but they're not equal. Um, an HTML page generated from a TEI document is also not equal. It's a different view. In fact, it's written in different, um, using different tags. So um, the TEI is the place where you generate, um, you can generate a number of views, but it's also the place where the, the uh, scholarly interpretations that you've created for your project reside in, in a single place. So as far as creating views of the edition um, or uh, supplementary indices or research aids or introductory editorial material, critical apparatus, metadata lists, people, places, um, all of these things um, are rendered in the data and have to be processed in some way. Um, you might not even generate a reading edition or an index at all. You might just archive TEI because it has all of this important information in it. So um, in terms of what you might produce from TEI, obviously HTML it, for web display is one of the primary modes. Uh, some people even um, convert it back into Microsoft Word, um, but a lot of other people would put it also into PDF for reading text view. Um, it really depends on how the TEI needs to be processed and for what purposes for the reader. <clears throat> but also um, generating analyses from the TEI is another important element. So once you have this data rendered in, in, um, in an ordered hierarchical content object, you can then use a language such as XSLT or even Python and R to generate analyses based on that data um, that for example, look out for um, linguistic statistics based on particular elements that you've marked up in the text. Sorry about that. And now I'm done. <laughs> Great, that's really useful, Christopher. Thanks very much. 
And I just got a meeting reminder.